It's Waxing Lyrical, baby. Hello, Waxers, and welcome to Waxing Lyrical with Mains and Dutch. I'm your host, Mains, my colleague, wet in the danger zone in Rainford. It's Mr. Neil Dutton. How are we, Neil? With the cricket season mere hours away, it is, of course, absolutely pissing down. We discussed this many a time, but whoever in their right effing mind thought that cricket season should start in April in the UK should be shot to the moon. Outrageous. May May to August, get it finished. Don't worry about the two peripheral months. Only bad things will happen. Yeah, yeah, unbelievable. But we're not here to talk about uh, cricket, although Neil would like to discuss it forever. Um. We're here to talk wide receivers this week. We got the privilege and the honour of getting back friend of the show, Matt Harmon, to chat all things wide receiver. We'll talk We'll talk Odell Beckham Jr. with him. We'll talk DJ Moore. And we'll also talk about why are wide receivers in the draft all the same size as me and Neil? And why is that okay now? I'm more gritty than shifty. I think I fall into Nate Tice. Um... <laughs> The, the wide receiver uh, archetype that he likes. I don't know about that because wide receivers that, that Nate Tice likes are two hundred and twelve pounds and six foot four. And no offense, meet you may have been one of them in the past. You're definitely not either of them now. And by the way, you were never six foot four. No. <laughs> Without further ado, though, let's get Matt on to talk about all things wide receivers. <laughs> And joining us now, host of the Yahoo Fancy Forecast, creator of Reception Perception, best friend of one of my favourite players, Austin Eckler, and a man who's fighting through a terrible cold. It's Mr. Matt Harmon. Matt, how are we today? Hey, boys, I appreciate you having me. Yeah, no excuses, no days off. Uh, everybody's got to play hurt sometime, you know, and uh, and this is my moment. Hopefully, uh, hopefully I can come through for you guys here. But yeah, I appreciate you having me. It's been Way, way too long since I've talked to you guys. Yeah, I so, was having a look. I think it was 2019, I think, the last go, time man. we spoke. So, Neil, I, I think that raises a good point, right? Matt's been on several times. One of our favorite people to talk to. Explained reception perception to us. Talked through wide receivers. Pre-NFL. Now with Yahoo. And the question I ask, Neil, is, I don't know about you, but I didn't get the opportunity to send my decline to Matt's wedding. Because I never got the invite. Did you? Did you get your invite and did you send the decline? Something must have gone missing. Just got lost in the post. Okay. International mail, guys. That's a <laughs> that's a tough one. That's a how tough are you one. enjoying? You know, actually, how it, are you enjoying married pretty, life, Matt? Oh, I mean, it's great. Listen, um, you know, especially once you live with someone, I think before you're you're married, it's almost like this weird thing where you go into go into marriage and you're like. Is is this gonna feel different? Is this is it just gonna be kind of the same thing? But something is definitely different. I mean, besides the fact that there's like a, a binding legal document between the two of you, <laughs> uh, the, the, you know, it's, it would be much more complicated to break up. But uh, yeah, I, I I love it. I mean, it's great. We actually, uh, my wife and I are planning now, and we're we're gonna do it. Uh, move across the country back to Virginia, where I'm from, um, in the next like month and a half. So. Uh, it's coming down to the wire here. Our last few months in LA, you know, she's from here. She's lived her whole life here, so she's kind of ready for that next adventure. And I, I'm excited to be uh, closer back to home. So there, but it was, it's been great to spend our first year of marriage here in LA and in our in our house together. So I, I couldn't be happier, man. I, I'm the luckiest guy in the world. I, I don't know what I did to deserve all the things in this life, but I'm, I'm glad it's come this way. See, I, I moved house from. As the crow flies, it's about six miles away from my mum and dad's home to the home I live in now. And that was a bloody ball ache in terms of how much stuff to take and, and move and whatnot. Travelling from L.A. to Virginia. Um, I, I, well, no, I'll just use the phrase, fuck that. <laughs> I, I honestly don't think I can cope with that. Yeah, and I've already done it, man. That's the worst part is, uh, is, is this will be my second time going all the way across the country. And, um, you know, not only... Do I have another person coming with me? We have significantly more stuff. We even have – there's a, even another dog involved now, you know? So we're like 2Xing, 4Xing the amount of things. Really what I'm focused on, Neil, is 
getting rid of since you said since you cursed i'll work blue here i'm trying to get rid of as much shit as possible before we can leave like facebook marketplace i don't know i keep joking that it would be great if like we could just get robbed you know if, <laughs> if <laughs> just leave the door wide ass open uh let everybody come in you know just take i mean there's some things i'd like to keep you know the smokers maybe don't touch the guitars it'd be great if you could leave the podcasting equipment um alone although that's yahoo's so like really whatever that that's their problem not mine like if i could just, no tvs leave the tvs but furniture couches the heavy stuff you wanted to rob us that'd be great and it was just, obviously we're you know we're at the time of the nfl calendar where most people are talking about uh the draft and draft needs and yourself you know you're doing this series with yahoo now of uh, teams that can shape the draft was listening to a pod, I think you did it last week, and it just, something you said, it really inspired this question, which is one of the main reasons we want to get you back on, and that is, how many lives could have been spared if Galen Erso had just said, thermal exhaust port underneath the main port? <laughs> That's a great, great question. I mean, well, also, but we would have probably lost an entire movie, um, and, and as I mentioned to Scott Pianowski, I, I, I thought Rogue One is sneakily my second favorite star wars movie so you know i mean galen urso's own life may have may have been spared if he had just uh, if he had just mentioned that you know but as we, as it with everything with star wars there's probably probably would have been an easier less circuitous um safer way to do things but i mean listen neil we got a great we got a great movie out of it and there's been some absolute duds in the star wars universe over the years but i mean rogue one just from start to finish absolute heater so you know what shout out to the bothan spies and all the boys who had to die to get and girls who had to get it there but i mean the movie was great so worth it there's a eight there's a sorry mate uh, there's like an eight bit cartoon series i saw it on youtube a while ago and one of them is the architect of the death star so obviously this was before rogue one and he is explaining the fact that you know the design flaw that was so ruthlessly exploited by Luke Skywalker is actually scientifically impossible because exhaust doesn't work that way. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's like we live in a galaxy with space wizards and, you know, people are blaming me for this thing going wrong. It's it's genius. <laughs> yeah. I mean, come on, zip it. OK, there's a there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of things that you can find. A pl- I, I hate when people do that in movies like star wars um although that is funny to think like the architect of the death Death starts like give me a break this is literally not possible no way but um i hate when people in the real world do that with movies where you know they pick apart a plot hole in a movie where yeah there's people moving shit with their minds and you know uh choking people from across the table with the force all this other nonsense it's like we've let we've lost a thread a long time ago all right we don't we don't need to don't need you poking plot holes in the Death Star design. My sister's uh, mate did think Titanic was unrealistic, which was a problem. <laughs> don't don't look at the bottom of the ocean, then. What what I, what I like about Rogue One, which, as you said, um, is a great film, and we will eventually get onto NFL, is is um is the fact that the screenplay for that and the screenplay for my second favorite um, Star Wars capacity of recent years, Andor were both written by Tony Gilroy. You can't stick Star Wars and finds it really weird that people like space stuff. Um, but anyway, <laughs> um, let's talk NFL. Um, in recent days, um, Odell Beckham Jr. has become a Ravens player. Um, is this a classic Ravens move? Is this something you do to try and win games? Or is this something you do to try and save face and get your franchise quarterback to like you again? Well, I do think the good part of it um, is that it can be a little bit of both. You know, it can it can be a, a way to show Lamar Jackson like, hey, we're we're serious and, and all that, you know, and because as much as, you know, we in the media talk about Odell Beckham and, you know, he's been such a strangely covered player and, and he's been a bit of a strange guy himself since he's come into the NFL players in the NFL seem to uh, except Baker Mayfield seem to love Odell Beckham and really gravitate to him and and he carries a lot of respect and gravitas in the league so it was not surprising to me to see you know Lamar Jackson really a part of the recruiting process I mean it was surprising to see that he was 
so a part of it just because of the whole contract impasse and you know the, the trade request and all that but it's not surprising to me that, that the signing of Beckham would get him gassed up so you can definitely um accomplish like hey look and I think the Ravens could look at it like hey we're gonna pay Beckham maybe more than any I mean more than anybody else right like we're gonna give him a contract that nobody else is willing to do but 15 million with some incentives to Odell Beckham for one year is better than let's give Lamar Jackson the Deshaun Watson contract that nobody wants to give him, you know? So I think they could kind of, uh, if they can bring Lamar off the figure that he wants and op- overpay Beckham a little bit, I think they can kind of justify that. From a purely on-field perspective, Mainzie, I get it where you're saying, like, is it the classic Ravens move? Because they seem to never sign a receiver who's, like, squarely in their prime. They either draft guys in the first round, you know, to, to varying degrees of success. You've got your Brashad Perrymans that, that never worked out. And then I think like Marquise Brown's a pretty good player. Uh, obviously that relationship went frosty though. So they do that or they sign guys like in the, on the back nine or whole 18 of their career uh, that, that like never in the prime ages. But I do think Beckham is a bit of a special case just because you know, and I always say this, like when you look at his reception perception data from early in his career, You know, he was performing at uh, like a top five receiver that's ever played the game level. Uh, He never went below the 98th percentile success rate versus press coverage in each of in any of his Giants years. He still owns several of the top five ever recorded success rate versus man coverage scores. So when we say Odell Beckham will never perform at his peak again, like that's the peak we're talking about. So if he can be which I think he was in Cleveland when you isolate him from surroundings and even what and especially with the Rams was like a high quality starting level NFL receiver. If he can be that guy after yet another injury concern with the Ravens, I I think it's a little bit different than some of the kind of vagabond veterans they usually sign. I mean, as you say, the the Hall of Fame of wide receivers they've signed is you know, they got Derek Mason was a bloody good player for a long time for them. Yeah. Uh Steve Smith, of course. Then you've got, as you say, you know, Jeremy Macklin and Deshaun Jackson last year. It was like, it's not 2008, boys. Um, you know, we did this, this, we, like, we did this three weeks ago, Neil, and you forgot Anquan Bolden then, and I'm going to remind you of Anquan Bolden again. <laughs> but yeah, I understand what you're saying. I I I totally forgot that uh, Jeremy Macklin ever played for the Ravens. I mean, <laughs> that, uh, that one escaped me. Um, I'll also say that, you know, I mean, I, you know, I always got to defend my guy, John Brown, but he did have a pretty good year with them. Uh, was like on pace for a thousand yards before Joe Flacco got hurt. Like he, he was a pretty, and he was kind of sort of in the square prime of his career, but was coming off like the weird sickle cell stuff in Arizona. I mean, they've signed, they signed Michael Crabtree when he was post 30 years old. I think that was with Lamar too. Um, Lee Evans, if you want to go back even further, he, he, he gave him a not great year. Uh, so, I mean, it's, it has been just a laundry list. And then you get like your Sammy Watkins two times, two times, uh, they've, they've signed Sammy Watkins, Demarcus Robinson. I mean, even the Nelson Aguilar thing earlier this off season, it's like, Oh, come on. Like Nelson Aguilar is probably going to be like this two this team's number two or, or receiver. But if Nelson Aguilar is like your speed slot and you're not counting on him, okay. I mean, for like a million bucks, that's fine. One person that I actually thought that the Ravens, given the archetype we've discussed, that Ravens might look to add this year was actually DeAndre Hopkins. Now, we don't know what's going to happen, although it looks highly unlikely that he'll be back with Arizona, especially as Jonathan Gannon come out with his, uh, oh, we'll see. Yeah, I'm an Eagles fan, Jonathan. I know what waiting for we'll see with you means. Nothing. Um, Do you think uh, wherever Hopkins goes, is he still, he's not obviously, again, He's probably not in his prime anymore, but he could still he, he's still a viable starting receiver in the NFL, isn't he? Yeah, his profile's up on reception perception because I, I thought I thought he'd be traded by now. Um and I still like a lot of what I saw from Hopkins. I think he's kind of underrated as a route runner. You know, he gets profiled as a guy that doesn't get separation based on his highlight real contested catches. Uh but that's because that's just the strength of his game and his quarterbacks have trust to, for him to win in those situations. But in terms of his stuff, like as an intermediate level route runner, he's a pretty good separator. He can still beat man press coverage as an outside X receiver. And that's what I think. I I think he ends up getting traded on draft day. I, I can't necessarily pinpoint an exact landing spot. 
I mean, Buffalo and Kansas City obviously would be awesome, especially from a fantasy perspective. That'd be great to see him there. But this class of receivers is mostly filled with slot receivers, potential flankers. Uh, there's only a handful of guys like maybe Cedric Tillman and A.T. Perry that are like tradi- – and Quinton Johnson, although he's a little bit of a mercurial guy himself – that are like true X receivers. And those guys like Tillman and Perry are going to be at best second day draft picks. So I could see a team looking at it's like, all right, we didn't get one of these receivers. Like let's flip a draft pick for DeAndre Hopkins because there's just not a lot of X receivers available in this class. And I agree with you, Neil. I do think he could still be a like a high quality, maybe maybe fringe number one type of receiver in the NFL. There's a question that we were going to ask later, but you've you've touched on it there. Is you know the the X position? Is it is it just that this year's class just doesn't seem to have any of that type of player? Or from what you've seen, you know, obviously your research is that position almost being phased out almost because of how college the, the college system is evolving. I think it's the hardest position. Obviously, it's the hardest position to play uh, at the three at the three receiver positions. And you're, I do think over the last maybe five years that teams aren't necessarily pigeonholing themselves to putting their best receiver in that X position. I come back to a couple of examples. The first time I thought about this and exactly what you were saying is like, is the X receiver sort of going out of style was the Minnesota Vikings teams around like 2017 with Stefan Diggs and uh, Adam Thielen. Like Stefan Diggs was their flanker receiver. Adam Thielen was like their big slot receiver. And then they would throw out like Laquan Treadwell or, you know, whatever, as I mean, Treadwell is a, a, a dramatic example because he was like a draft bust, but they would just throw like, oh, let's just throw anybody out there at X receiver, like who can give us some heft as a blocker. But like, yeah, we'll just throw him out there to run vertical routes. And even if he doesn't get open, like these two guys are such great separators from the flanker and slot position. Our quarterback, whether it's Case Keenum or Kirk Cousins or whoever is going to have layup throw after layup throw and really high level stuff. Uh, Another example is like the Dallas Cowboys. They took Amari Cooper and put him in that flanker role and were able, they're able to move him around pre snap, get him some more favorable matchups so that he's not facing the best cornerback. He's not running the most difficult routes. Michael Gallup. Meanwhile, who's a better, obviously a better player than anybody the Vikings had at that X receiver position. They could throw him out there to win against press man coverage, win in contested situations and run those vertical routes. Meanwhile, Cooper's getting fed all these targets because he's a little more uh, of that that higher percentage route running guy. So I, I, I do wonder if teams continue to look at that and maybe this draft class, because even some of the guys that have come out and have been really good, Neil, haven't necessarily been big time X receivers. I mean, Justin Jefferson plays all three positions. CeeDee Lamb, again, with the Cowboys is like a power slot type of player. I think he could play out at X, but he's just going to get such better looks on the inside there. Even Garrett Wilson, you know, he played some X receiver towards the end of the year, but he also started the, his rookie season as primarily a slot and flanker guy moving around pre-snap. Matt, on that, maybe it's just me or maybe it's just the way it's being reported or the way the teams are drafting now. But like when... When Tavon Austin was drafted, everyone was like, wow, that's crazy. He's really small. <laughs> and now everyone's the same size as Tavon Austin. And there's less... Now, there's probably still concerns about um, durability and you know going over the middle and all that kind of stuff. But our teams... Like, you hear the Green Bay Packers have like a size, almost like a size limit on, on wide receiver, and they've got to be so big and so heavy. But a lot of teams are just not bothering that. And, you know, with I think with the with the majority of the lads coming out who seem to be in the top half of the draft this year, they're all almost under six feet, under 200. Yeah, the Packers are a great team to bring up because, you know, I, I remember like – people wish casting them Elijah Moore back in the draft. And then even when, uh, when they were trading for, you know, the Aaron Rodgers, which still still hasn't happened somehow, um, you know, they were going back and forth. It's like, Oh, maybe they'll send him back to the Packers in the, in the, in the, uh, in the trade there. But yeah, they have, apparently I think it's 195 pounds is their, is their limit. So I, I would have loved Chris Olave to be a Packer. He didn't end up going in that range, but he was a guy that probably wasn't on their board, at least that high. You know, and and if that's true, like 
they're crossing off Jordan Addison. They're crossing off Jalen Hyatt. They're crossing off Zay Flowers. Like you know, and those, uh, Josh Downs is the second round guy. I really like who's like 170 something pounds. So yeah, you're crossing off a lot of dudes if you're in this class, particularly if you're if you're uh, setting it at 195. There, I I do think that teams have changed a little bit. But at the end of the day, it comes back to, like, can you run real big boy NFL routes? Like, not these little Mickey Mouse routes that uh, Looney, playing in Looney Tunes offenses, as Charles McDonald called it on the, on the Yahoo show. Um, you know, it, it, can you run real routes? And, like, I think some of these guys like Jordan Addison and Zay Flowers are, like, running real legitimate NFL route trees that, like, Tavon Austin back at West Virginia was more of a gadget player, like, Jalen Hyatt at Tennessee is definitely not doing that. Um, You know, so I think it does kind of depend. And also, I think the the rise of 11 personnel, like having three receivers on the field, having that slot receiver potentially being more of a volume guy in offense, that makes a big deal uh, in terms of where you can position guys on the field with with that smaller frame. I think that's one thing that I've heard just listening to Philadelphia Eagles related podcasts coming up to the draft is that a lot of Eagles fans and writers and whatnot are thinking that they do need to upgrade their third wide receiver because Quez Watkins, bless him, was, you know, he had a down year last year. And people are saying yeah. in the draft, ooh, who are the slot receivers? But other people are saying, no, 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 no. They need to get an outside receiver so then they can move either Smith or Brown into the slot, dependent on their flavor. So it's, you know, it's it's that idea of, again, it's pigeonholing where, you know, I think a lot of teams now, as you, as you say, want the wide receivers and the whole offense in general to be a bit more flexible and, you know, to, people aren't going to know what's uh, getting thrown at them. Yeah. And also I think we focus on height and weight and number one, you know, this is something we're working on at reception perception. Uh, Josh Scott, who does some great research projects for us is, is kind of working on this right now. Like really the ability to get open has nothing to do with your, your weight. I know that's like a, a, you know, kind of a trope that, oh, these lighter guys, they'll be better separators. Well, again, if they're if they're not explosive and they don't run real NFL routes, like they're not – that has not – the weight has nothing to do with it. But what does matter is, like, your arm length and your wingspan You because know, a lot of, like, hand fighting and arm work, that's a big deal in terms of getting open and obviously winning in contested situations too. And, like, just for example, Devontae Smith, just because you brought up the Eagles is what made me think of it. He has like a 69th percentile um, wingspan. You know, he has pretty decent arm length, pretty, pretty big, hand, like 39th percentile hand size. But a guy like Jordan Addison is like wingspan is 28th percentile, 20th percentile arm length, hand size at the 9th percentile. So like Devontae Smith, it's like you we focused in so hard on the weight that I, I think we lost the thread of where the technique um, comes from there. So. I, I don't know. I, I go back and forth on I, I kind of think like obviously A.J. Brown would be a good big slot receiver. We saw him do that in uh, in college and Devontae Smith would probably thrive there as well because he's such a good technician. But like these dudes are also legitimate matchup nightmares and coverage dictators as outside receivers. I guess if they wanted to upgrade their slot position, and I think Quez Watkins being a guy who did give them some speed at certain points, like there are guys like Marvin Mims that could do that for you later on in the draft uh, for sure. A player who, you know, was associated with the team that you were formerly associated with, um, <laughs> DJ Moore. Obviously, he moved to probably not 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 his wish, uh, but the wishes of the two teams. He moved to the Bears. A lot of people are making parallels between the trade that I say that the Buffalo Bills made for your mate Stephon Diggs, or the Eagles did for AJ Brown. We know it's not that simple that you just plug in good wide receiver and automatically elevate quarterback. But could you see him helping Justin Fields some way, the way that those other guys helped their quarterback? Oh, absolutely. And I agree with you that I think DJ Moore is not at the level of player that Stefan Diggs was when he moved from Minnesota uh, to to Buffalo and nor is he at the level of AJ Brown when he was in Tennessee and, and he moved over to Philadelphia. But it could certainly have a um, a similar effect. And yeah, I, I agree with you. Like probably wasn't DJ's wish. I don't think he was asking for a trade. And, and reportedly, um, I think it was Drew Rosenhaus said this on the Pat McAfee show, his agent, that when the Panthers called DJ, like they were in tears about it, you know, because they didn't want to give him up either. But hey, the, the Bears had him over the barrel. 
as good as DJ Moore is, like you, you need to get a quarterback. We we know what the Panthers look like with DJ Moore and no quarterback. It's more important for them to have have a quarterback. So, you know, I, I think going to Chicago though, what's really interesting to me about DJ Moore's fit there is that I think he can help them in a, in a couple of different ways. Number one, they have not had a X receiver who can win in the vertical game with Justin Fields there. You know, Allen Robinson was there in Justin Fields rookie year, but that was a weird year for him where he was, you know, kind of beefing with the team, the contract impasse. Uh, then, you know, Justin Fields, what didn't start the year, didn't get reps in training camp. And, you know, Matt Nagy just, well, we get to week three, week four. All right, fine. We'll throw him in there, I guess, and get him killed behind a bad offensive line. So we haven't seen Fields with that type of player and and DJ Moore is like a true again he can win in that X receiver position he can beat press man coverage at a pretty good rate you know 65th 68th percentile rate in reception perception but I also think like this Luke Getzey offense is you know offshoot from the Packers with uh, Aaron Rodgers and Matt LaFleur they get receivers in motion a lot they get receivers in you know some of these flanker routes slot routes that are are more layup patterns and you know, Fields didn't had a guy like that either. And, and I think DJ Moore has been underutilized in terms of his after catch ability. The last few years in Carolina under the Matt rule staff, that could be a big way where he helps the bears. Uh, so even if he's not as good as, as AJ Brown or, or Stefan Diggs, he could certainly have a similar effect for Justin Fields where he gives the quarterback like, Hey, if it's isolated man coverage, I know I can go to this guy. And Hey, if I get this guy, a, a, an in breaking route from the slot or the flanker position in pre-snap motion, he can I can get the ball to him quickly before the pressure arrives and he can make plays after the catch. Matt, I'm going to utilize your knowledge of fantasy and reception perception here. We're going into year two for Drake London, Garrett Wilson, Chris Olave, Jameson Williams and Jahan Doxon. Of those for next year's fantasy teams, who should people be looking at to crack, to try and snap up as quickly as possible? Yeah, I think, man, that class is so good. Um, you know, just when you look at the last this that class versus this year's class, it just doesn't have the same type of high end talent. I think that I'm probably going to rank them to me coming into the league. I ranked them in terms of pure talent. I ranked them Chris Olave, Drake London, Garrett Wilson. Um, Garrett Wilson, I think, is and that's no shot to Garrett Wilson. It's just those other guys are really good. I think how they played in year one, it would probably go. 1A, 1B, Chris Olave, Garrett Wilson, and then, you know, Drake London actually not that far behind. I think he was in isolation away from the disastrous quarterback position. It was awesome as a rookie. So, but the quarterback's still a question there. Like, if Aaron Rodgers, this trade finally gets done, I do think Garrett Wilson will and should be the first off the board, especially because, you know, this receiver core now looks like not, not necessarily a, a bad position, but one that, is kind of top heavy with Wilson and then Alan Lazard. And I still think Corey Davis probably not on the roster. And then like, I mean, McCall Hardman, is that really going to be your slot receiver? So like we could be looking at 140 targets from Aaron Rodgers for Garrett Wilson. And he's like a superstar level player in my mind already. So he would probably be one. I think Chris Olave then too. Chris Olave is such a great player, legitimate number one receiver, Drake London, probably three. Although I, I really am infatuated with Drake London's ceiling. I think he could be an awesome talent. Those other two guys, I think, are interesting. Uh, Jameson Williams, like I think the 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 Lions could still add another pass catcher in the draft. Maybe not a receiver with their first round pick, but like potentially a tight end. Maybe one of those big receivers that I mentioned on day two could be added as their ex receiver. And like, I think there's a net zero percent chance that Amon Ross St. Brown loses the top target position on the team to Jameson Williams, even if Williams is a really exciting player. And then. I mean, I love Jahan Dotson. I think he's a he's a great player as well. But uh, I could see him being better than Jameson Williams in fantasy this year pretty easily. I'm hoping um, you're right on that, um, Matt, as a as a Washington fan. As although I, I'm 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 kind of I am a fan, but waiting impatiently for someone to say NFL breaking news franchise sold. Yeah, um, that would be great. <laughs> the, the thought the thought of I mean. Even last year with the corpse of Carson Wentz and uh, Taylor Heineke running around crazily, some of the plays that Doxon made with McLaurin is is special. Like so, yeah, I'm I'm hopeful yeah. that we get more of that going forward. Because for someone who literally in the kind of small receiver conversation we had before is literally me 
in terms of height and weight. There's no way I could do some of the things that Dotson does on a on a yeah. on a Sunday basis. He's unbelievable. I mean, I all of these, and I actually, in terms of the guys we talked about, like Jordan Addison and Zay Flowers, stuff like that. I think John Dotson was a better prospect coming into the NFL than those guys. And he ended up getting drafted 16th overall. And I'm sure you, I'm sure you saw a man, you know, Washington kind of got dogged for that pick a little bit. Uh, yeah. Like they thought people thought it was a reach. That, that was the thing that happened, but he was awesome as a rookie. And, and the way he wins contested catches down the field. I mean, he had a lot of practice with it at Penn state, he got even more practice with it with old Carson Wentz in the first few weeks of the season. Yeah, I, I love Jahan Dotson. I don't know that he's ever going to be like a true number one receiver, but you have Terry McLaurin to do that. And he's an awesome, awesome compliment that if he continues to get better and better, maybe he does become that type of uh, number one receiver despite the size because he has the route running chops, the technique. He, I, I think he has the – in terms of the last three classes combined, I think he has the best hands of any receiver in those in those three classes. The last question we've got for you, Martin. Obviously, we appreciate you – battling through, you know, to talk to us. You know, it's men, many have said, you know, it's incredibly therapeutic speaking to us when I say many. Um, I'm feeling I, better I, already. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, the question I have, and obviously this is, you know, very much on brand for me, and I'm very glad to see that you've been, you've joined this cause as well, but how do we reignite the middle-class tight ends in 2023? <laughs> in fantasy? Honestly, man. I think that people forget just how big of a factor health played at the at the position last year. And, you know, you get people like it just seems like NFL offenses are phasing out tight ends. I'm like, show, show me the real evidence of that. I mean, yeah, Darren Waller was hurt last year. Mark Andrews even got hurt at times last year. Kyle Pitts, like, obviously was a huge disappointment um, to start the year. But Drake London was much more productive when Desmond Ritter took over. Who's to say that, you know, Kyle Pitts wouldn't have been more productive when uh, when Desmond Ritter took over. You, like Marcus Mariota just wasn't a serious quarterback for the Falcons last year. Like, I think Kyle Pitts is going to be fine going forward. He got 1,000 yards as a rookie. So I don't see this evidence that uh, even Zach Ertz, like people forget that the tight end cancel culture mob conveniently forgets that uh, Zach Ertz was on like a tear to start the year. He was very like an answer at the position. And then he got hurt. You know, Kittle obviously always kind of deals with injuries. Um, You know, uh, there's plenty of players that I think just we just need to reignite that middle class. Like you said, it's a perfect way of saying, you know, TJ Hawkinson, I think, was is is a good option there. All those guys I mentioned, Darren Waller, like if he stays healthy with the Giants, he could be a big part of it. But I think the thing to look forward to down the line, Neil, and I heard this on an episode of, of Prospect to Pros. It's an athletic show that um, Dane Brugler and Andy Staples and Lance Zierlein do together. Andy Staples was making the point that as like the power forward position is sort of being phased out of college football, a lot of these guys that are, you know, that the six four two fifty types are going to play tight end, and it would like this guy used to play basketball is always a trope at the tight end position. But if it changes more at the lower levels of the sport and then infuses with more tight ends, because this is supposed to be a great tight end class, and there are more guys coming, so the few there actually might be a huge future at the position more so than people want you to think. This uh, whole t- cancel tight ends in in fantasy, give me a break. I'm looking forward already to someone taking Brock Bowers ridiculously early next year and then making him block just just to <laughs> just to piss me off. Yeah, I mean, that that is that is the thing. Nobody has enjoyed my wide receiver blocking breakdowns this offseason and, and consistently talking about it. But um, it does matter at the receiver position. Obviously, it matters even more to tight end position. And I think that's a big part of like why we tend to get frustrated with these players on a on a weekly basis. But it's important and it, and it does matter. Yeah, say Denny Carter always says, you know, in in line with the song, you know, tight ends, tell your coaches you're not going to block anymore. You're just there to catch passes. It's simple as that. Yeah, exactly. What could go wrong? (laughs) Matt, as always, a a privilege and a pleasure. Let's keep it shorter between stints next time. Um, Get better soon, and we will speak to you soon. Absolutely, boys. Appreciate you having me. And uh, yeah, hopefully I was able to mute myself for all the sniffling and, and sneezing on the other side. But I uh, appreciate you guys having me. And, um, we will definitely, definitely not uh, have as big a gap as we did this time. And that was a brilliant Matt Harmon there. Fighting through, having this flu game. 
but giving us loads of really interesting information and reminding me how much I do love Jahan Dotson. Which is nice for you to like something about that team. I like two players on that team. Both of them play wide receiver. The rest of it, pretty much in the bin. But there you go. Um, Neil, that is that is it for this week's show. Next week, I believe you're making me do a mock draft, which I'm looking forward to tremendously, i.e. best start listening to this week's prospect, prospect of pros, like Matt mentioned, or the draft-related shows are available. Um, and make sure that I'm understanding which... Which which of the wide, which were the quarterbacks I'm going to take first? The small one, the boring one, or the one who could be Josh Allen? We'll find out. Yeah. Just remember, you know, the boat is a boat, but the box could be anything. It could even be a boat. And without that, without further ado, that is us. These top guys are out. <laughs> <laughs>